Welcome to this video, and all the way from sunny Sydney, Australia, I'd like to welcome uh, Rosny Neelon Cook, who unfortunately is a former registered psychologist, but we may well come on to that. Ros, welcome, thank you for, for coming on. Thank you for having me, John. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you. So you've started, a, or you've found a member of an organisation called the uh, Cape Byron Lighthouse Declaration. And I think the evidence there really is on the lighthouse, isn't it? And the uh, what the lighthouse represents. Yes. But what what is? How did all this start? I mean, presumably a few years ago, you were a happy uh, psychologist specialising in children and families. Um, mm. Did something yes. go wrong? Something did go wrong, John, and that was like so many of your listeners and yourself was the. COVID lockdowns and the government response to the COVID lockdowns. I, uh, psychology is my second career. So even though I'm well into middle age, I have only, uh, you know, been in this profession for 15 years. Uh, what was concerning me the most about what I was seeing was the damaging effects of the lockdowns, the potentially damaging effects of the lockdowns on the children and the families. Um, I'm not actually in Sydney. I'm in an area west of Sydney called the Blue Mountains. And the reason I'm raising that is that I don't know if you even heard of it, but uh, about six months before the lockdowns, we had one of the worst bushfire seasons in Australia uh, yeah. that we'd ever seen. Did you hear about that? And where I live, we're in a tourist community. So we had already, the, the local population had suffered dramatically in terms of loss of income. There were no tourists coming because of the fires. And when we see that in a population that's primarily based on tourism, we see, of course, the, uh, I don't know if it's natural, but the increases in uh, drug and alcohol abuse, domestic violence, uh, you know, all sorts of abuse throughout the uh, lifespan. And when COVID came along and they were talking about blocking the cruise ships, etc., which bring in a huge amount of the tourism here, I was especially worried because we'd already lost a whole summer season of tourism. And when they were talking about stopping the cruise boats and locking us down for a long time, I was very, very worried because ultimately the, the children that I work are downstream of the impacts on the parents. And when parents lose their income, when parents also are locked at home, of course, you get, like I said, the increases in domestic violence, in uh, drug and alcohol abuse, and that flows down to the children who end up being highly traumatized. So I was very, very concerned. However, as a relatively new psychologist, I didn't think it was my place to speak out. I assumed people sort of higher up the chain, as it were, would speak out uh, because it was very obvious to me early on that the psychological impact of this were going to be devastating, not just a little bit devastating for generations. So that's how I came into this, yes. And, and what did you do with these concerns initially? How did you uh, express them and w so were you able to communicate with your leaders? And I tried to. Initially, I, like I said, I sort of waited. I think a lot of us did. Uh, then I would speak to other people, whether it was friends, family members, other professionals. And I remember this sort of growing disquiet as I would see almost these highly intelligent people with these sort of numbed out faces. They just were not taking it in. But again, I kept thinking, well, who am I to, I must be wrong. I must somehow be wrong because surely the powers that be, who are far as I felt more superior to me, they will come in and fix things. And the, when was it? So the first lockdowns were 2020. My sense, I actually thought, and I hate to say this, but I actually thought that it was going to be the Northern winter of 2020, 2021 that was going to see so much psychological collateral damage. I mean, can you imagine being a, a, a mum, a single mum in a Glaswegian housing estate with five kids, having to homeschool them, etc. So I thought there was going to be such, it would become obvious that this was far worse in terms of the psychological impacts and people would do something. It didn't happen. Uh, so I did, I, I tried to speak out. I, in the end, I don't know if you remember, but we had, so we went into this four month lockdown. We had incredible lockdowns here. Uh, we went into a four month lockdown in July, 2020. And it was very obvious because that was sort of, if you remember back in that Delta time, um, we knew 
because of the, what they were saying in the media, that it was going to be months, it wasn't going to be weeks, this one. And so that was the point that I wrote to the psychology boards, I wrote to the various different professional associations, and I said, very you know, politely, what are we doing here? We know the collateral damage is going to be enormous. Uh, uh, what can we do? And I was told uh, very uh, frankly that... Uh, yes, we understand, and other psychologists have written in as you have, but you must understand that if you do speak out, you will face disciplinary action because of the Australian government gag orders. And I remember, I see your, your response to that, John. I remember having such a visceral response to that because I thought, that's the way they talk in North Korea or China. And I mean, that might sound naive now, but I couldn't believe it. I would face disciplinary action because I'm terrified about what's going to happen to the children of the country and the planet at large. So, but what they did say was that they said other psychologists have written to them. And at that point, I didn't realize any had. So I ended up contacting two uh, psychologists that I know who are very, very experienced trauma psychologists. And it, again, it was always so hard to open up those conversations, wasn't it? Because people would think you're some sort of conspiracy theory, theorist anti-vax, which is how the whole media had programmed things. Uh, so I sort of gently asked them, something feels a bit wrong. And they just launched in. Yeah, absolutely. This is appalling. And so I suggested that we make a video together. And the three of us were going to do that. However, at each point, each point I wanted to bring up, they said, oh, we can't say that because we could lose our license. Or we can't say that because we could lose our license. And by the end, it was going to be so sort of impotent that there wasn't much point in doing it. So in the end, I decided... I, I just have to. I can't not speak out. Uh, I'll, so I'll do it alone. Um, and I'll do, you know, extensive due diligence to try and protect uh, my license. And I did. And it was during that process that I found out so much more than I realised. It's quite incredible, isn't it? It's a psychology, medicine, science works on debates. It works on thesis, antithesis, synthesis progressive dialectic development, exchange of ideas. And here we had this top-down, totalitarian, authoritarian, dictatorial yes. edicts saying, shut up, do mm. what you're told, mm. ignore your professional training. There's no debate here. We know best. Your role is to obey. Your role is to say yes. I mean, I'm reminded of the sort of, um, you know, it's almost like a Stanley Milgram situation, isn't it? Where... Uh, Absolutely. It's a Stanley Milgram situation. 100%. All of the... And that was one of the things, John. What was interesting was that when I decided to make that video, what I was trying to communicate was that the collateral damages were going to be extensive. My sense was that... And I, my family's uh, English. Uh, my mum grew up, you know, was born during the Second World War. And so there's a real legacy there from the sort of keep calm and carry on uh, period. And... I thought it was more about raising awareness in this very, very unique time in history where in the Western world, we haven't had major uh, calamity on home soil. And that's really unusual. And so previously, the whole community was wired in a more sympathetic, and I'm talking about autonomically sympathetic way. Uh, whereas now, most people, we don't expect those sorts of things to happen. Like I said, I mean, I've traveled a lot. I've been to Russia and Turkey and all these places. And I used to sort of laugh a little bit when I'd see their very overt corruption and think, oh, that, that had never happened in England or Australia and how wrong I was. And so that was the premise with which I was uh, initially making that video. But then when I started doing the really, as I said, deep due diligence, I suddenly found this whole new world of censorship. And that was the piece I didn't know about, the censorship and the propaganda. And then the horrible realisation that this, the entire population is highly, highly traumatised. It's not used to being traumatised because there haven't been these, uh, you know, extremely stressful situations in the Western countries generally. Um, and not only that, but that they were using and really deeply misusing, weaponising psychology to make people comply. I was so deeply distressed by this, John. I kept thinking I had it wrong. I kept thinking I had it wrong. How could this be going on? That I, you know, I told you when we've chatted previously, I ended up, I lost two stone. I, I, the existential distress of this 
it blew my world. I, I couldn't fathom that in Australia or England, the governments could actually be deliberately censoring and deliberately putting out this highly coercive propaganda to make people fall into line, obedience, be locked at home with those dam potential damages, but then ultimately be... <sighs> Coercion isn't even... It's not strong enough a word. Uh, people ultimately had a gun to their head. Take this vaccine or you lose your job. You, you felt you were advocating for your patients and your clients. You, you were a professional advocate acting in their best interests. Absolutely. Yeah. Because I, I see advocacy as fundamental to the role of any healthcare mm. provider. My, mm. my patient doesn't know things. They're in a vulnerable situation. So I advocate on their behalf. And is that what you felt you were doing? It, it, it absolutely was. And what I also did, I'm sure you have something similar in the UK, John. We have, I know they have the same thing in Canada. In Australia, if you work with children, we have something called mandatory reporting obligations. Mm. Do you have something similar? So if we have a sense that there might be any form of abuse or neglect, uh, and there's eight different risks of significant harm that they're put down as, that, that we must, as professionals, uh, indicate that to the, the various authorities and normally that's done on a case by case base but in this situation when I went and looked again at all of the different eight forms of potential harm and they go through from physical violence neglect uh, risk to the unborn child that was another huge one all eight forms absolutely unequivocally were going to be you know were potentially at risk from the the government response so I put my video out as a mandatory report and what was interesting was that I spoke to a lawyer. I was really nervous doing it as well, John. I didn't want to do this. I'm not someone who speaks up generally. Um, you know, I've never done anything publicly. But it got to the point where as a parent and as, a, as someone who worked with children, I can't, I couldn't not, not speak out. But so I used that mechanism. And I spoke to a lawyer the night before I put, finally had the courage to put that video out. And I said to him, uh, I, I want to do this as a mandatory report. How does that sit with the gag orders. So we had gag orders, you didn't have them. We actually had gag orders put on us in Australia. All health professionals do not speak out against the government vaccine policy. And uh, he said, he said, oh, that's a really good idea. He said that actually trumps, he said at law, mandatory reporting obligations to protect children are higher than gag orders put out by bureaucracies. So, so did these gag orders include lockdowns and other, other COVID uh, restrictions? No, they, they were just about <clears throat> the mandates, the vaccine mandates. And that's how they got me, because even though I spoke a lot in that video I made about the psychology, not only the psychological harms, but I was trying to raise awareness uh, with the public about how the whole community had become so divided into these sort of, I don't know, tribes or versus man united football tribes right um but i did also talk about the precautionary principle and at the time they had just started the uh, vaccine rollout and they were uh, coming after the pregnant mothers and the you know which to me was always i mean just from a common sense point of view we've lived through thalidomide and all you know so many other of these situations surely surely giving untested chemicals to pregnant women when we tell them they can't eat certain cheeses and soaps yet we're going to put untested i mean for goodness sake so that was actually what they used to suspend me even though i said uh, very clearly uh, as a psychologist i can't speak about these things however there's other professionals that are saying it they still took me down for speaking out of line so statutory, st statutory introduced legal obligations prevented you from carrying out your statutory legal mandatory reporting requirements. Yes. It's just a complete contradiction. Yes. It's... And I might not be using the correct legal terms, John. Uh, someone might jump on me for that. So certainly the mandatory reporting requirements are statutory. I think the, the gag orders were under some sort of emergency powers, and I don't know if that it might come under a different moniker. I'm not entirely sure. Mm. I'm interested in the, the psychological techniques that were used by the government to, to get people to comply. Um, I mean, what, yeah. what sort of, what, what is the, the psychology there and how was it 
used used in in the Australian situation? The psychological piece, I think, for me, has uh, we could talk for hours about this, John. It's it's really enormous. Uh, I think for me, as with so many others. It's been one of the most disappointing pieces because I think people really need to understand when I went into psychology as a second career, I sort of, again, naively assumed people went into psychology because they wanted to help people. But actually, vast numbers of the, of the highest uh, performing psychologists at university are cherry picked by, and I'm sure you can guess who, advertising companies, gambling companies. Uh, now it's Silicon Valley uh, but also these nudge units and uh, uh, the BIT units around the world. Nudge is an interesting euphemism, isn't it? Isn't it? N n nudge, nudge means uh, covert psychological manipulation of thought. Bingo. Yes. Yes. And one of the tricky things with the nudges is that so many people, and I think it's sort of there's a inverse correlation with the more educated and more letters after your name, people think they're immune. Oh, I'd never fall for marketing. I'd never fall for advertising and, and nudges. I, uh, I'm too smart. Um, I probably had that arrogance in my 20s myself. Yet, if that's the case, let's have a look at all these multi-million or billion, is it, advertising companies around the world. What's really key with the nudges and any of the marketing, gambling, psychological use is it all targets the unconscious areas of the brain it, tar it targets the the back areas of the brain um i'm sure you're aware john but possibly uh, some of the viewers aren't it's estimated about 95 percent of our decision making just our everyday life how we go around the world how we respond to different situations is mediated from the back part of our brain so uh, from unconscious decision making and those unconscious drivers which are very very primal drivers they're very innate they actually are there's different estimates between 200 and and i think someone is saying 20,000 times faster and more powerful than our prefrontal cortex and this again if we're sort of going back to what i was saying before about we live in this unique time in the west we sort of really reify our prefrontal cortexes don't we we it's all about Who's the smartest kid in class? Who can hold the most data? And that's this part of the brain. And it's very, very clever. And it's great for doing maths. And it's great for all sorts of things. But it shuts down when we're stressed. As you know, it goes offline. Or, or it certainly loses a lot of power. And the nudges were all based on that. They were based on the fact that people are operating from the back parts of their brain. They are highly distressed, highly fri frightened. They're sympathetically aroused. Uh, and, and what happens, shall I go into that, John, or is that a bit yeah, too... Yeah, no, please, please do. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, please. So just as a, a really basic psych 101, when we are under extreme stress, our brain and nervous system completely change the way they operate to if we're just sitting in a, in a calm one-on-one -on -one situation. And what the body is trying to do is it's trying to ultimately keep us alive. So it takes the brain, it takes the resources away from these newer parts and it sends them down to the major muscle groups, the legs, the arms, so that we can fight or run away. And people will know that as the fight flight system. And that's all fantastic if you're fighting a bear or I don't know, if you want to jump out of the way of a car. So if you want to jump out of the way of a car or you want to start yeah. a fight or you want to run away from something exactly. or pursue a mate or escape from a saber-toothed tiger. Ex exactly. All those saber-toothed tigers we have around at the moment. Let me just close mm. that. Um, then it works very, very well because you move very quickly. Um, however, in a situation where there is not actually real physical life-threatening danger, it can cause all sorts of problems because what we ended up with back in... 2020, it is 2020 that this all started, isn't it? I get a bit confused. Yeah, it's 2020. It is, yeah, it is. We ended up with all of these families uh, and friends completely divided again, back into those sort of football teams, highly intelligent, rational people, people with pre-existing deep connection who were completely separated. And what happened, going back to the brain, so what happens is if you and I are talking if you have a different point of view to me, if I'm calm and in that parasympathetic state, 
I'll say, oh, that's interesting, John. Oh, okay, all right. And then I might go off and have a think about it. But if you are yelling it at me or it's coming out of a media screen with red and loud noises and, oh my gosh, everyone's going to die from COVID, then again, the brain goes into the sympathetic arousal. It sends the, most of the blood down here and the prefrontal cortex, the range constricts. So you can't hold two conflicting views in space and rationally deal with it. Um, and very unfortunately, this is when the psychological defenses and the nudges come in. Because as we now know, I didn't at the time, uh, but everything had been programmed to, to separate, to have people into, well, they didn't want to separate, they wanted everyone, didn't they, following the, the government line. And the way they did it, I'm not sure if you've saw the, seen, there's now been some sort of review papers that have come out on which were the most success, successful nudges by gender. Have you seen that? No, I haven't. Have no. Seen those? So again, and it, it just... It's, it's so disappointing, to say the least. So for the women, it was all about sort of you know, staying in community, looking after your children, etc. For the men, it was about, I can't remember the term they used, but it was basically that you're a wimp if you don't get vaccinated. And at this point in history, when men have really, I feel, lost their role it, it, the, the waters have become very muddied um to then have the government subconsciously saying to you you're a wimp if you don't get yourself vaccinated get your family vaccinated you're a coward you're unmanly you're and not protecting the weak man that's up. it that's it man up that's exactly it and it just it's it's so manipulative it's it's horrific what they've done i i really I didn't realize this when I made that first video, but now that I've gone and looked at what all these techniques where they used, it's, it's um, yeah, I, I almost feel ashamed as a psychologist. Um, but with that, John, I do just want to say, it's very easy for people then to jump on the psychologists that work in the nudge units and say, oh, you know, they, they're, they're complicit, they, they're, they're evil, all of these things. But I really do believe the vast majority of them, they're young. They get cherry picked out of university. They go in, they get given these big salaries. And they think they were doing the right thing. I don't think they were all thinking for one moment that they were trying to manipulate people towards bad ends. And they were, obe they were obeying orders and conforming. Yeah. Um, it's a bit, I mean, the Solomon Ash thing comes into that as well, doesn't it? You know, that you just Absolutely. conform with, with those That's around it. you. It's, it's got psychology all over it. But the, it, the idea that there was an organized department of government that increased fear to increase our sympathetic activity, to deliberately reduce our rationality is really quite perturbing. And everyone, what everyone watching Ros knows, I, I, I get anxious sometimes and I hate, I hate the feeling, of course, but the, the worst thing about it is it robs you of your rationality. Yes. You yes. can't think straight. You know, normally I'll say, OK, we've got a particular situation here. Let's look at the airway. Let's look at the breathing. Let's look at the circulation or whatever it is. You know, that's a, in a first aid situation. And as long as there's no catastrophic hemorrhage initially, you know, you, you have a rational way that you work through these things. And, and the anxiety just 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 robs you of that. And it's just it's just it's just horrible that, that this happens. And it really is. It does. I think it does attest to the potential power that governments have and, and should act as a warning of, of potential dystopian situations for the future, because these powers are real. This psychological manipulation, which I would call it, you might euphemize it to a nudge. It's these things are real and we're all susceptible to it. We are susceptible to advertising. You know, we, we are, most of us are average drivers. We're not above average drivers, as we think, because by definition, it's got to be an average. You, you, know, you know, people have this unrealistic appraisal of themselves. And I am prone to external environmental stimulation and other people and authority massively. I would say a lot less than I was before the start of this pandemic. But uh, yes. Yes. But let, let, let's go on. What, what led to the, uh, what, what is Lighthouse, uh, Ros? What, what, why did, what is Lighthouse? How did that start? The Lighthouse Declaration. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So really, I, I, I know you will be aware, John, and um, possibly some, most of your readers are, but the, the Cape Byron Lighthouse Declaration, it really was a homage to the Great Barrington Declaration. 
Uh, and if you remember with that one, that was focused on, well, it was revolved around focus protection for the elderly and the infirm. They were saying, stop these lockdowns, too much collateral damage, let's focus on those ones who actually need uh, extra protection. Um, so our declaration is about raising the awareness concerning censorship, and that is censorship of vast numbers of health professionals around the world, uh, all who, like we've been discussing, were deeply troubled with what was going on with the COVID policy. And really trouble, you know, that was particularly troubling was that this censorship and propaganda, especially, it gave this false impression that there was only one truth. They, they kept talking about trust the science and with the implication that anyone else, uh, any other narrative was unscientific. So it's about freedom of speech. It's about letting people know that there are huge numbers of health professionals speaking out who were many who was you know subjected to what can be described as highly draconian treatments from the medical boards and the governments around the world we were sort of like the naughty kids in class that they were making an example of with the aim ultimately of terrifying others into submission obedience and in my case they took my psychology license i was threatened with jail i was threatened with huge fines uh, and they even ran a psychiatric assessment on me that I didn't go to. So we've still got, as you know, again most viewers will know, a complete media blackout of any alternative viewpoints. Uh, people that do speak out are often ridiculed and tagged with those words that again have been nudged to the 99th degree and weaponized, things like anti-vaxxer and conspiracy theorists. When people hear those words, they sort of automatically switch off and yes, so really it's about letting everyone know that we're not this bunch of, this fringe bunch of dangerous crackpots, which is what the media is saying, that there's actually large numbers of us and we, are, we do know what we're talking about and we have a very different story to tell. It's terrifying. You don't agree with me, therefore you're probably mentally ill. That really is uh, the ultimate <laughs> statement in arrogance. So we, we, have the, we have this problem of censorship basically all around the world now. Do you think, and it's, it's, it's not just these, these issues that you raise, we've got things like um, particular treatments that should be available for open discussion and debate. Um, we've raise got that as well. Th yeah. Things that are done, thing, things that aren't done, um, yeah. you know, but, but put in your own examples in your own particular professional Absolutely. situation. That's it. I mean, are nurses, doctors, psychologists, any, all these people, or even ordinary citizens around the world, are they seeing this or, or, or is it, they're not, are they not seeing it? And if they're not seeing it, why the heck not? So I think one of the, and as I mentioned to you before, John, I was back in the UK for a month at the end of last year for, for a family visit. And after I lost my license, I spend most of my time speaking to people like yourself who are aware of what's going on. I spend very little time back in whatever you want to call it, through the other side of the looking glass. When I went back to the UK and I lived in the UK for many years, I went to uni there. Um, I spent a lot of time with different family and friend groups who I, people I really love and respect, uh, highly intelligent people, but none of who know what's going on. And I remember after about three or four days of it, I thought, I can't do this. I, I, I've got to get out. This is, it's too hard. Um, but actually it became a complete gift because I was living in worlds and we spent a lot of time in a lot of different households where people were reading, I don't know, whatever newspapers, they were watching the BBC. They were... Yes speaking yeah that's right but i think the thing that we can so easily forget there's so many doctors health professionals all sorts of people really in on our side whatever you want to call it who are so frustrated with these people and think they're either stupid or complicit but having that window back into that world really reminded me and it's critical for i think people to understand is they're not stupid or complicit they have no idea and if they do hear, I think one of the mistakes that we've made, and I've certainly made it myself, was right back at the start, we would just send all this information to 
our friends and our family because we wanted them to know what was going on. We would try and send them all this data. But again, when people are highly psychologically defended in the face of a potentially enormous existential threat, they can't process a lot of new data. So even if you manage to get a tiny bit through a crack, what will they do? They'll go to Google yeah, or they'll go to Facebook. And there again, they see not these people are crazy anti-vax conspiracy theories. Just stay away. They're dangerous. And on and on it goes. So you might even go to a fact checker to check the facts. Yeah, ha ha. Right. Thank you, Reuters or all of those <laughs> friendly news initiatives. I know. And so this is one of the pieces for me. The most important piece is psychological awareness until the whole playbook that they've used is a psychological playbook. And so until people understand the psychology of what's going on, it's really hard to see a way out of this mess. And I, I do struggle, and I, I've mentioned this to you previously, John, and I've said it publicly, and I, it, it doesn't often make me popular with a lot of those in the truth of community, as it were, especially the medicos. This is not a medical debate. It is a medical debate, ultimately, but ultimately it's psychological. We have to understand how people got where they were and how people ended up with the opinions they did. Because if you, we have a lot of people who, oh, let me get, let me put this in better words. If you're in a situation where you are in those two football tribes, where you're highly divided, whether it's about COVID, whether it's about gender, Ukraine, climate, it's all the same thing fundamentally. If you have intelligent people who are holding a very different position to you until you understand the psychology and can look at how they have come to the conclusion they have come to you're really you're never going to get anywhere you're just going to keep seeing them as some sort of um, opponent but I really believe, John, that the vast majority of people, for sure, we might have some personality disorders and psychopathy up at the top of government, up at the top of the pharmaceutical companies, up at the top of media. But the vast, vast majority of people are good. They're lovely. They love their families. They tried in that awful situation of COVID to protect their families. That's all of those innate drives. And if they were totally caught up in the whole media story, then they believed vaccinating their children, vaccinating pregnant women, all of that was the best thing to do and that we were dangerous. So really being able to look at the stories of other people, hold the compassion for them, that really is the pathway out as far as I can see it. Most of, again, or a lot of the medical people still believe that they just have to shout data louder and louder to the governments, to the courts, um, but for me, I don't believe that's the way. So, so we have a lot of people that are simply preconceptual as to the reality of, of what is going on. Yeah. Largely because it seems to me, because I think what you've said is that it is, it's kind of a garbage in, garbage out sort of situation, isn't it? That because the media is controlled, because the narrative is controlled, because there is one single narrative, because dissenters from that narrative, such as yourself, are punished. We, we end up with a situation where, well, well, I want to use the word Orwellian. It's an Orwellian situation. There is a particular truth. And if you don't hold that truth, you, you might be sent for a psychiatric assessment. That, that, that is really quite fright, frightening. Does this tie in with, is, I don't know, I've, I've written down a couple of psychological terms. Though. They may not be psychological terms. I've got sort of mass delusions and the madness of crowds. Is that... One hundred percent, huge group psychology. So, when I talk about these pieces, I usually uh, explain that there's sort of four primary pieces that are psychological pieces that are causing this. First one being, as we said earlier, uh, the majority of people are uh, their daily life, their, their their intellectual processing is unconscious from um, wired up at early childhood. The second one is that when we are alarmed. As I've already said, we go into the back part of our brain. Um, the third and fourth ones sort of speak to this. I'll, I'll talk about the third first. The, the third is the reliance on primary caregivers. So when we are small children, obviously, we have to rely as humans on these 
strong primary caregivers to protect us for at, at least 10 years. You're going to be lucky to look after yourself after that, but you might. And so strong is that innate driver that very, very sadly, if a caregiver is unsafe, so they're either uh, abusive or negle negligent, what the children sadly almost always do is they internalize it is that it's somehow their old, own fault. Because a child cannot, does not have the capacity to reject a primary caregiver. So even if you have a child in a highly abusive situation that has the potential to go into a foster home, they will prefer to stay with their current caregiver than go into that foster home. And so even though that's when we're children, when we then grow up, and this is all, of course, unconscious, right? These are unconscious drives. When we grow up and we go to university and move into our first apartment, that sort of thing, that reliance on primary caregiver, it doesn't just dissolve when you turn 18 or 21. It unconsciously transfers to the government and the institutions that are there supposedly to protect us. So again, if that government does something that's unsafe, again, whether negligent or abusive, we will still prefer to default, especially when we're stressed, to what they're saying. And so moving on from that into the fourth piece, which is the group psychology piece. Again, I think it's like we just talked about with advertising. Group psychology is a piece that people think they're too clever for. I'd never be part of a group. I'm a free thinker, et cetera, et cetera. But the group psychology piece, I think, has been the number one driver of what's gone on. We are pack animals. We, we are. We, we, we swim with the... The, the, the shoal we fly with the flock and once again the higher the stress goes the more we will cling to that pack and it's been it's it's one of the most interesting pieces for me uh why many of us didn't and that's an extraordinary complex piece i think there's a, a, a i've certainly got quite a few theories on that um I There's suppose the psychological theory here would be attachment theory. Is it, is it, is it Bowlby and people like that did the original? Well, that's, yeah, fascinating you've sent that, John. So, look, I think attachment does have a huge piece to do with it. And really interestingly, it's the insecurely attached who are more likely to see. This is one of the few times that being securely attached, because if you're securely attached, you, at a primal level, trust your caregiver. And so that, again, transfers on to the government. And so the people who I see, and, and this is a really delicate piece because people have this uh, assumption that if we're talking about insecure attachment, we're talking about, oh, you're telling me that my mother didn't love me. Not at all. Insecure attachment is something that travels down, down the family line. It is a massive, massive piece in post-World War II. Again, this is a piece we could talk about for a long time. Like I was talking about before, keep calm and carry on. That leads to insecure attachment. But it came from a place of love. We have to protect our children who are seeing bombs, who are having many family members blow up, you know, be killed at the front. So we don't do emotions in our family because it, it leaves people too vulnerable. That's insecure attachment. So I also, I, I, there's a building site next door to my place at the moment. There's... Um, Croatian guys there, I find, I see again and again and again, people who grew up in countries where they had, former Yugoslavia, what we would now call unsafe caregivers. So what happens is they grow up and there's just the amygdala's scanning a little bit more for danger. They're not just assuming everything's okay. Whereas if you grow up in the West with a secure attachment, you're much more likely. Why should people distrust their government? John, and this is a huge piece. This is what made me so sick when I found out. We should be able to trust our government. We should be able to trust our media and our doctors and the medical boards. Do you just tell, just, do you relate that, that a bit to the amygdala. The amygdala, the amygdala is this kind of gatekeeper to the to the to, to the higher yeah. centres. Is it what what to, the amygdala? What yeah, so, so I, and again, this is why I believe everyone needs to understand basic psychology. I used to teach it to five-year-olds, and I can even, I'll just go over here and show you, because I've still got them from my telehealth sessions. This is how I used to show the amygdala, can you see those? Yeah. To small children. So we've got the anger and the frightened rabbit, and I would describe the amygdala as the security guard, and the security guard wants to keep you alive. He's, he's a big, strong bloke. He's not very smart, right? 
and he makes mistakes. And so the amygdala really can be thought of, it's sort of like the fire alarm of our, of our brain. It's looking for threats to keep, us a sa to keep us safe. A lot of the, what we might now call the ego, exists there. It's there to keep us alive. But it has false alarms. And so if you grew up in a family or grew up in a country where there was constant conflict, right, then your amygdala is going to be looking out. It's going to be looking out for danger. You're less likely to believe everything you hear. You might have a bit more of a, hang on, a questioning uh, authority mindset and yeah so people who grew up in countries where there were uh, where there was um, warfare or trauma uh, children who grew up in um, traumatic situations again they're far more likely to see it than people who are securely attached and had a really easy life in the west and that is a lot of doctors and a lot of medical work not all but a lot yeah. So, so a, a lot, of, a lot of us are are essentially pre-programmed to conform, 100%. to be good little citizens. One hundred percent. Yeah, I think there's a genetic piece in there as well, but that's for another day. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, that goes to attachment, doesn't it? If if parents weren't well attached, then their children are likely, and we can get this kind of generational. Um, Not that one so much. I think there are some of the dopamine and serotonin transporter genes that uh, are implicated. I used to work with a subset of the population that are um, differently termed as highly sensitive or uh, have differential susceptibility. Have you heard of this uh, sort of area of research? No. Do you want me to talk about it or are we going on too long in the yeah, two? Just, just give us a quick couple of minutes, yeah. A yeah, quick couple of minutes is basically uh, about 15 years ago, just like Darwin and Wallace who came up with their theory at pretty much exactly the same time, there were different groups of researchers who came across this same theory uh, at the same time. Some of them were working with children, some of them were working with mosquitoes. I mean, it was extraordinary. What they found is that Again, they have different numbers. So I call it on average about 12.5% of the population. And that's all the way down the phylogenetic scale are highly sensitive. And what that means is because people get a bit upset and they're saying, oh, you, you're saying I'm emotionally sensitive. No, it's environmentally sensitive on various ways. It, it, it means people respond. There's more plasticity in their response to various situations. How I've there's various explanations uh, the one that sort of intuitively fits right with me is that it's sort of a speciation event um, similar to the way we would consider a canary. You know, we'd put the canaries down the coal mine, right, mm. to see if right, things were dangerous. So these highly sensitive people are, it's a for better or for worse situation. So if you put them into good environments, they flourish. They are the top percent of musicians, of intellectuals, etc., etc. If you put them into a highly stressful environment, they go the other way, right? So they, they fall apart. They end up um, drug and alcohol problems across the board. Um, but the theory goes that the speciation, the reason genetically we're still here is because our job is to go out and seek new fields, as it were, just like the canary. So if we go out and we find a new environment that's highly uh, safe and, and a flourishing environment then we do really well, so then the pack will follow. And if we go down the coal mine, it's horrible, so uh, no one follows that. Um, but the way I sort of see that relating to what's going on at the moment is that it is the job of the highly sensitive phenotype to scan the field, to look, to look at everything. And really, it, it's, it's a piece of system thinking, right? It's an ability to see the field. It's an ability to look out and hold more variables in mind and consider how they are going to affect the organism and whether ultimately they're going to be safe or not. So in this instance, they're seeing all sorts of things that are highly unsafe. So what I find is that the vast majority of people I speak to in the resistance or freedom community, whatever you like to call it, are highly sensitive. Uh, a lot of them have a lot of trauma, a, a lot, both. I um... So I started off being fairly compliant because mm. I'd kind of been forced to comply for my professional career uh, following the guidelines, which to be fair, for most of my career were, 
uh, based on and a lot of them were wrong of course but they were based on the best available evidence at the time mm. so have, have i but now but, now i question absolutely everything so can can i can, can you change to go into this yes. from the 87 and a half percent into the 12 and a half percent can you learn to be one of the 12 and a half percent is that what absolutely. i've done Absolutely. And it has to be safe. You have to understand a bit of psychology and it has to be safe for you, for you to be able to. And I, I'm really glad you brought that point up, John, because I also did a com complete 180. I actually, right at the start, in those highly dramatic first few weeks of lockdown, I tried to, um, I asked my doctor about getting my daughter on the vaccine trial. Uh, this was sort of 18 months before it even came out or a year before it came out, because she had a highly compromised immune system. And at the time, they said COVID was only a risk to the elderly and to those with compromised immune systems. Um, I think that there's a lot of people, again, in the re resistance community who get very angry with people who do 180s and who change. I think the most powerful thing is that change, is by turning around from, you know, being in one position, going along, being compliant again why would we question the government's telling us to do this it's unsafe uh you know this the, the sorry the covid's unsafe um why would we question it we live in england we live in australia there's no propaganda they will tell us the truth so <clears throat> it takes quite a time and quite a lot of I, I i haven't heard your story john but stress and distress to make that change doesn't it well but for me it was cognitive dissonance you know yeah. we, we the science was saying that the vaccines were perfectly safe just to use the vaccines as one example mm. you know the science was saying that, that the official science was saying ivermectin is a complete waste of time yes but then i was talking to doctors in africa who who told me they were saving lives with ivermectin mm. i was talking to uh um kyle the, the first vaccine injured person i interviewed and he had severe myocarditis from a safe vaccine. I got this tremendous dissonance. And yeah. it, it took a while. It actually it, does. it, it actually took quite a, a few months yeah. of this evidence to accumulate. Mm. And then yeah. the evidence was accumulating and accumulating. I say, no, 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 all the, all, all the official teaching can't be wrong. Mm. You know, the government does have a best interest at heart. Oh, then it was almost almost overnight. The dam just burst. It does. And I yeah. thought, just a minute, this emperor is absolutely stark naked here. Yeah. And and it was it's quite a distressing situation. But I mean, I'm I'm, I'm I'm glad to be in the the twelve and a half percent. I, I, mm. the, the, is it the red pill? I get them mixed up. Yes, the red pill. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. That's get, it. My, get my pills moved. Is the twelve and a half? The, the amount of people now that are realizing what's going on is increasing so is this 12 and a half percent now getting nearer 20 percent do you think i look that 12 and a half percent like i said came from a particular field of, yeah it's just the genetic predisposition uh, yeah, yeah. yeah so i don't know i've heard so many different figures with this i don't know john but if i can i'd really like to come back to the point you made about how distressing it was mm. now yeah. for for different reasons we were exposed myself through my daughter's health um and you, I guess, because you were a nurse educator and you would be hearing from a lot of different people. Most people aren't exposed to it. As you said, like, same as me, same as most people I speak to, the, the, the veil lifts very slowly. And the way it works is that the subconscious mind is, is sort of being, people talk about planting seeds. It's being peppered yeah. with bits of information. And it, 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 it forms a mass, the, the neural networks start forming together and then it will sort of start coming up into consciousness. Like I said before, people might look on Google, then it goes back, but then more comes in and it starts coming. So when you finally go, oh my, it is very fast and it is very distressing. And that's the piece that, it, that people really, I'd really like people to understand is that if we can take that viewpoint about, it's almost like waking a sleeping baby it really is, isn't it? You can't go in. If you go in and scream at it to wake up, you go in very, very gently. Is that if we can hold compassion for people, that when they find out, the ground's going to fall out from under them, as it did for so many of us. And we have to do it really, really gently and put away all of this division, which has been deliberately done. Most people are good 
vast majority of people are good and are trying to do the right thing. So if at all possible, and not everyone can, like I constantly told that, especially by people that have been really bullied by the governments and lost their licenses, it can be hard. But try and hold compassion and, you know, give them these small pieces of... It would be much easier to, to live in this delusional world, but... But personally, I, I want to remain in touch with reality. I do want to follow the evidence, and mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you, you don't you don't always necessarily like the conclusion, and, and and especially when it contradicts some of the the axioms, really, that you've lived your life by, and, and you realise that that they were actually wrong, and and, and then th th there's the there's a bit of a shame and embarrassment, really. I mean, I mean, you know, I. I I believe the propaganda on vaccines. Huge. And when I realised it was propaganda, I thought, just a minute, mm. I wrote a textbook on physiology. And one of the chapters on that was in natural immunity. Where did that go? Yeah. I wrote a chapter on it. I taught it for 30 years. Mm. And, and yet mm. you, you don't seem to have that rationality. And then when you realise it was propaganda and you think, H how could I not... Mm use that information that i'd spent my life accumulating mm -hmm. and you can tell that even now i'm, I'm still confused <laughs> yeah it's um it's That's not right. a nice place to be it's not a nice place to be and, and we still certainly don't have all the answers i mean i like you john i i pretty much fell to my knees when i realized i was like oh my god they're using psychology they're using all of this propaganda um yeah it's been incredible what they've done the shame piece is one of the biggest psychological blocks that we're dealing with especially in the medical profession it's the piece that has to be handled again most sensitively and it's the reason i think raising awareness about the psychological piece is so huge people are have you heard of double bind theory gregory double blind double blind theory gregory bateson no okay so so double bind theory in a nutshell it's it's where people are in an impossible situation damned if you do damned if you don't they happen frequently in family situations uh but in this situation as an example if you take your average doctor around the world they have studied incredibly hard to get where they are they have a hippocratic oath which is a, an extremely important piece to them so they have the hippocratic oath i will look after and do the best for my patients and then they have a government saying in some countries you are gagged but in other countries it's pretty much implied so they're ultimately completely stuck now bateson's way out of the double bind is he says the only thing that you can do is shine the light on the double bind it needs to be named because when it's named then you can start looking at solutions and again coming back to the doctors i think they're in an extraordinarily difficult situation. Yes, there might be some who are starting to become aware of what, uh, what's going on and who are too scared to know. There are certainly others that still simply don't know. I remember having a great chat with Claire Craig when I was over a couple of months ago, and she said to me, Ros, you know, your average doctor, your average GP in the UK, they work huge hours a week. They're parenting, they've got all this huge amount of juggle that we all have these days. They might watch the BBC at night, They'll get their regular updates from the GMC. And if they do get sort of a whiff of something isn't right, then they'll go to the GMC or whichever their appropriate professional boards are and be told the same party line. So it's, um, it's very, very difficult for them. And I think, again, we have to be so careful about how we treat people who can have this huge barrier of shame. For people, I mean, if you imagine highly intellectual doctors, other professions who see us as fringe anti-vax conspiracy theorists, that's what they've been told, to have to do this complete 180 that we're actually right. And especially with doctors whose whole self-concept was built on from childhood, being the smartest kid in the class, this, the potential for shame there is so huge. So we need to let them know you were manipulated, you were psychologically manipulated. You did the best that you believed. You know, you did what you thought was right. So to come. That's one of the reasons. I, that's one of the reasons I kind of make these videos. Really, you know, to, to, to admit you're wrong, to admit you have shame yeah. about it. Yeah. It's quite hard to do, but you know, maybe if people see me doing it, 
they, they, they might follow you know it's um that's right noskiti epsom huh know thyself that's what it's all about what we've said also makes we don't need to name them but makes sense of some historical situations where totalitarianism and uh dictators have, have, have taken charge and to 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 rebel against that standard narrative um it be, becomes remarkably difficult and uh mm. One of the things that really terrifies me about about this whole thing, and one of the reasons yeah. it's so important to do this, is dystopias are possible. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we do have, I mean, North Korea maybe is the classic example now, but we do have dystopias where all these manipulative techniques can be used by small amounts of people in power yeah. to control large numbers of people. Yes. Also, de- also using the kind of divide and rule strategy Mm-hmm. I mean, there, there was there was a point in, in our colonial history where about 40,000 British civil servants administered 400 million people in India. How can that be? Well, get Maharaja A to slightly disagree with Maharaja B. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, then you've got smaller groups to, to control. And um, mm-hmm. we have the division. We have mm-hmm. the ongoing psychological manipulation. And I think it is fair to call it psychological manipulation from mainstream media. Yes. Where there is there is one narrative, anything else is attacked, mm. um, anything else is not trusted, anything else is disinformation. Fact checkers tell you what the facts are, but the fact is they're making them up as they go along. And there's the medical there's the medical version of that, of course. Sorry, the medical version of that is, is, is medical journals now. You know, often publish what is bought and paid for. Yeah. Absolutely. Sorry, I interrupted you, Oz. What were you saying? No, no, I, I, I'm not sure because now another point's come up. Absolutely. And for me, I don't know if it was 15 years ago or 10 years ago. Do you remember Marcia Angel, what she said about the Lancet and the NEJM? So do you remember her? I mean, that should have... I've seen... There's quite a few similar articles that, where the alarm was raised well and truly. Yeah. And so she basically said after, I think it was 20 years as, as editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, she said, I can't do this anymore. I can't watch the amount of um, corruption, for what of a better word, by pharma. They're cherry picking what goes in. And uh, so I can't do it in all good conscience. And I thought, I remember at the time thinking, oh, brilliant. That's that then. No, on they go. But I think with the psychological piece, yes, people throughout history have been caught up in various psychological manipulations. But the thing is, it's like with a magic trick, John. When someone shows you a magic trick and it can have you absolutely perplexed for hours, when they show you how they do it, it's gone. And this is the same with the psychological piece. And this is why a big part of the work I'm doing outside of Lighthouse is to start educating the public about what's gone on very safely to show them. Because it has to be done in a way to take away the shame. It's not because people are stupid. It's because people have directly targeted their unconscious brain, which will always win the race, drive the behaviour. Why is it, maybe, maybe we've spent the last while discussing this, but why is it so hard to admit that you're wrong? And is that harder? Yeah, well, 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 I mean, is that, the, is that part of the problem? Yes. So I think, and I'll talk from a a British and a masculine point of view here, because I grew up in a very uh, British, very masculine family. Um, I believe one of the biggest problems we've got is that men particularly are raised, and especially sort of private school boys, um, they're raised to discount their emotional life. When they're little, if they cry, stop being so sensitive, I'll give you something to cry about, all that kind of piece. And again, I don't think this came from a place of any sort of malevolence. I believe it came from the place of, ultimately, the men are the physical protectors, the men are the warriors. And so historically, we needed the men to be tough. And so we we sort of pushed down the, the emotions. So we have all these men walking the planet, running most of the big organizations, the media, the the pharma, all the sea levels, yeah, who don't have, most of them, there'll always be exceptions, but don't have that emotional realm. Their whole, again, self-concept, their, you know, their ego, and I'm not using that in a pejorative sense, is formed around their intelligence. 
I rose to this level because I'm highly intelligent. Um, so this is all, if this is all put across as, which it has been, the intelligent versus the, you know, the idiots, the science, trust the science versus the idiots who don't get science, then, I mean, they've done it beautifully, John. You've got to give it to them. You've got to give it to how they've manipulated this. So we have to. We can't. And this is the piece. Presently, we've still got everyone trying to screen data. Look at all these vaccine injuries. Look at this. Look at this. Trying to shock them awake. It's not going to. I don't believe it's the way. They have to understand and that they've been manipulated. How do we, how, how do, how do we do that? And how does that lead us into the future? Mm. So I believe we have to, we're going to be obviously doing these bits with this podcast, but I think going into the future, we have to look at educating on psychological awareness right from the get-go. Children, parents, caregivers, it's not rocket science, like I showed you before. Even the basic parts I teach to five-year-olds, and they love it. They pick it up straight away. They'll be talking about their amygdala. Oh, there goes my fire alarm. Okay, all right, it's just my amygdala. But if you try and teach that to a 50-year-old CEO of some big pharma company or 60 year old, it, it, it's much more difficult. So I think there needs to be absolutely, and I know we're talking when you're in um, Sydney, uh, I'll be talking about that piece that we need to look at widespread psychological psychoeducation um, and understanding of perspective taking. I mean, perspective taking is such a huge piece in this. Are you aware of the, the sort of the Sally Ann task that we use with children with autism? No. Sally Ann task. I'm glad it came. I'm learning loads of psychology. Please tell us. So this is a really basic one. And, and it's, it, I mean, it's mainly used in research, but it's how we get an understanding of a child's ability to consider how they are holding someone else's uh, perspective. So it's called the field of theory of mind. And the, you, yeah. And so basically I'm thinking A, you're thinking B. Do you know that I'm thinking A? Do I know that you're thinking B? And do, you, do I know that your thinking B might cause you to think, I mean, it ends up in this mirror of mirrors. It gets very, very complex. But the, I know he said, she said, she yeah. said, he thought. The bottom line yeah. is, with this task, it goes like this. So you've got these two little dolls. You have Sally and you have Anne. And Sally has a basket and she puts a chocolate in it while Anne is watching. And there's a basket in a box. And then Anne leaves the room. So you're showing this to three, four, five-year-olds. Anne leaves the room. And then Sally takes the chocolate and she puts it in the box. And so then Anne comes back in and you ask the child, where does Anne think the chocolate is? Right? So it's whether she was aware. So if they're very little, and I can't remember which ones I said, but she'll think it was in the, um, the, the place that it's moved to, the box. Right? But over five, they should know, well, hang on, she was out of the room when it was moved. But ultimately, what we've got currently is we've got this division that is created on adults who are failing the Sally Ann task. Does that make sense? So we're not understanding. We're just going, you're man united and you're an idiot, right? And I'm divided. We're not going, OK, so you think that these vaccines are safe and we're dangerous because you were fed this propaganda and therefore, right? And they can't see where we are. It's like labelling and stereotyping, isn't it? Oh, they're good at that. And they've weaponized those words deliberately. So anti-vaxxer, as soon as, as soon as people hear the word anti-vaxxer or conspiracy theorists. Do you remember those old 1970s cartoons and the evil villain would hypnotize people and they'd have those big spinning eyes? That's what happens. People hear anti-vaxxer and it's just, boom, there they are. Do you think, I hadn't planned to ask this question, but organizations can behave psychopathically 100%. That, that, that is they are motivated by money and that they, they can act in a way that is completely amoral to achieve their ends psychopathy means to me that people are just things to be manipulated mm -hmm. uh, 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 if i'm a psychopath people other people are just things i can step on them I yes. can do what I want with them, as long as it's serving my ends. Mm -hmm. Now, organisations can behave like that. Do you think that some organisations, and of course we're not naming any examples, but is it possible for organisations to be like that? 
because you do get particular people who actually are, and a very small proportion of the population are psychopathic, are in control or, or can be in senior influential positions in organisations. Mm. Yes. And not only companies, I would say that the vast majority of the institutions that currently govern us and are meant to protect us are acting psychopathically. I believe the, the judiciary, the government, huge levels of bureaucracy. And again, it's, it's really important to say it's not because there's evil psychopaths. And I don't even want to say all psychopaths are evil because they're not. But it's not about individual actors. As you say, organisations can form their entire new culture. And that as a group means that people will follow that group and fall into it. I really believe, and again, I think it's one of, a big problem we've got. There's a lot of red-pilled groups around the world who are still there trying to fight the governments, royal commissions, this, that and the other. I mean, I've, been, I've got involved in one here. But um, ultimately, the way most of those you know, solutions are trying to uh, to fix things is almost with this from this premise that there's bad people in those institutions and if we just take out those bad actors and put in good actors like you and me John then all will be hunky-dory yeah. but I don't believe that's the case at all I believe it's those systems and institutions that themselves very much in in the way you're talking about create the bad actors yeah that they have a particular culture they do that that encourages people to behave in a particular way yeah and, and of course over over time that in, involves particular people being recruited mm. so you know if, if you take an agency say the bbc in my country the way i perceive it it is a completely different organization with completely different aims now to the one i knew mm. a, as a young man you know, when I was working in remote areas in the world, the BBC was an absolute lifeline. You know, you'd tune in and go, D, 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 this is London. And that meant you were going to get the truth. It's changed, you know, you know in that last 40 years, it's just changed beyond recognition. Mm. You know, there's this evolution. And, and, and unfortunately, a lot of the evolution seems to have been in a negative direction. And I see the same in Australia. I see the same with governments mm. and the fact that this is happening in many places at, at the same time over, over the last 40 years really mm. happening in many places indicates to me there's a possibility that there's an external cause that's affecting all of these am i is that just being paranoid or is that a possibility oh so the uh i try and stay away john from what's behind this all there's some pretty diverse uh and quite terrifying theories out there i stay in my lane with this my sense is that in the last 30 to 40 years what have we seen we've seen uh, a huge increase in psychological manipulation psychological knowledge advertising marketing we've also seen this explosion of mbas right yep <laughs> so the M yeah and Masters of Business and Administration degrees, right, yeah. That's right. And so MBAs, their whole... Uh, I think our Prime Minister might have one, actually. I'm not sure about that. Might yeah, be. MBAs, I think, are a big problem uh, uh, because ultimately... And I worked at Accenture for a while back in the day, and I remember it was the last corporate I worked for because I remember seeing partners... And I don't even know. They're on half a million bucks, a million bucks, huge amounts of money who are our society sees as sort of the, the, the top of, of the tree screaming at each other like toddlers. The, the whole, or everything they're focused on is, is about profits and getting as much as you can out of people. It's about getting as many people as possible to buy stuff that they don't need by making them feel uh, insecure about who they are without having these things. Um, so I think that's a huge part of it. And then, of course, you had the whole behavioral economics field really start to uh, to grow and understanding that, again, the amygdala, the midbrain, all of those parts, nucleus accumbens, that whole reward pathway, how beautifully it could be manipulated to make profit. 
So I, I, I do think very, very sadly, that's a part of it, which again comes back to we need everyone. We need to take the rabbit out of the hat and we need people to understand how their brains work. We need people to understand because you, you catch yourself. I mean, my daughter, who's 14, she talks about it all the time. Oh, OK, they just went into a this, that or the other state. If you teach it from the start, you don't fall for these things so easily. And if you do, you can pick yourself up quickly. Uh, and it needs to be stopped. It needs to be stopped. Ros, do you think the current state of communications and electronic communications and web communications around the world is uh, part of the problem? Is it a potential ally? How should we look at it? That's a, a, a huge question, John. I think things are beginning to change. There's still a lot of division about the sincerity of that change. Certainly, if we take Elon Musk and Twitter, for example, we saw vast numbers of early voices uh, deplatformed, if that's the right word, deplatformed. Uh, they're now coming back on board. There's still a lot of people that have a lot of issues with Elon Musk. I'm sort of Switzerland. I don't know. Uh, what I do know is that currently we have a place where previously hidden and dissenting voices can now communicate with each other, which is good. Um, in terms of the rest of the communications, I think like the importance of understanding psychology, I think it's really important for people to understand how the algorithms work. I mean, not at a really deep technical level, but just in terms of the echo chamber. I think most people who are, if we're going to call them red pills, are now pretty aware of that uh, and how that works. But certainly, again, the, the vast majority of the people who are still completely unaware of what's going on, they don't know of all these other platforms they're looking at. They don't know that, for instance, if we put this video or, or I won't say YouTube, some things are banned on YouTube, some things are banned on Vimeo, some things are banned on Facebook. Um, it's, again, understanding that those algorithms are in place, but also how those algorithms, who are in charge of those algorithms, how, for instance, trusted news initiatives, um, fact checkers, as you said before, Reuters, have people, uh, board members, who are also on the boards of Pfizer, etc., etc. So, again, public awareness raising around those pieces is really important uh, with the focus on removing shame. It's not your fault. You're not stupid. You were manipulated and you weren't able to see this other information because of the way the technology is being used. Yeah. You're recruiting people called lighthouse keepers who have yes. a vision. What is a lighthouse keeper and what sort of visions do these people have? So a lighthouse keeper is, <coughs> with, we're sort of running the metaphor of the lighthouse. It's the people who are shining the light and showing uh, a way of safety through very, very troubled waters. Uh, initially, the... Sorry, I've got a little kitten here on my lap. Let's have a kiss. look. Here she is. Yeah. Oh. Hello. Look. There she is. This is Daisy. Yeah. Hello, Daisy. As um, long as she's well-behaved, she's more than welcome. She's well-behaved. <laughs> it's my other cat that we're trying to introduce her to who's not so fond of her. She's very frightened. Um, but when... With the Lighthouse Keepers, when Rob, Paul and myself initially came together about this, it was about, as I've said before, raising awareness about the censorship, about the uh, punishment for many of us of dissenting voices. And that was who we were primarily profiling. Interestingly, what's happened is as I've reached out to a lot of those uh, people around the world, a lot of them are under gag orders, uh, wanted to be Lighthouse Keepers, but under additional gag orders from lawyers, from their governments, uh, and so weren't allowed to speak out. So we've sort of spread the apron a little bit. So we have people who have, everyone's spoken out, certainly, but they've not all been um, disciplined in this way. Some of them left their jobs rather than lost their licenses. Uh, but, the, but the theme is speaking out, uh, going against the group, I suppose. Most of us have... Uh, it's, it's not been easy being a lighthouse keeper. A lot of us have lost friends, family, colleagues for um, sharing the messages that we have, but all of us would absolutely do it over and over again uh, because it's, we believe it's so important. 
so do do you want me to sort of say who they are or, or do you yeah do you... i mean i'll just reflect first there's threats at different levels um a lot of the people that i'm working with like yourself who are particularly courageous but have lost mm-hmm. th- their livelihood uh, to a large extent um a lot of younger professionals it's harder a lot of the people i talk to are older retired or at the end of their careers they're they're the most outspoken but there's yes. also another level of threat i mean i've had the police around with death threats you know there are some pretty weird people out there there are yeah it, it, it is it is quite hard in some respects yeah yeah it's so what, what, what sort of visions would, would these lighthouse uh, keepers have what, what are we looking forward to can I just jump onto two points from what you just yeah. said before we talk about that? The mm. first one is you talked about courageous people. Um, there's a lot of people who see people such as myself and the other lighthouse keepers as though we have some sort of personality trait of bravery and courage. And I want to be really honest here. This was this is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And John, I've had to have a meeting with John before this interview because I don't I'm not a public speaker I don't find this easy at all I you know I think courage and bravery is not about having no um, reaction to speaking out it's about pushing through all of your terror uh, and misgivings whatever it may be and still speaking the truth because for me at the end of the day as a mother and as someone who worked with uh, highly sensitive and traumatized children, I just could not not speak out. I actually stopped for a while. I thought this was all too much. Um, and I said, someone else has got to do this. And then I couldn't sleep for the next three nights. I thought I, in the end, I, I, I just had to, even if it meant I gave up everything. Uh, so please don't think that there's courageous and brave people and leave it to us to do. We need everyone to speak up. It's so important because the more people that speak up, the quicker the group uh, grows, uh, the, the, and, and that really is another sort of proxy primary caregiver. Another piece you mentioned, John, was about the retirees. Um, I was talking to Ros Jones, who I, I know you've um, interviewed mm, previously. Yeah, about. great lady, yeah. yeah. She's lovely. She's Pediatrician, lovely. yeah. Yes. Good, great, yeah. Great, great thinker. Incredible, incredible. She's one of our lighthouse keepers. And one of the things I've seen, and this isn't from Ros so much, but it's from other, other um, retirees, is our culture currently has, very sadly, elders and retirees sort of put out to pasture. They're on the scrap heap. We're a young marketing. If you're over 40, you're gone. We're beautiful. You know, it's that whole sort of thing. And this is, again, really unique in history. We always used to listen to our elders. They held the wisdom. And I really believe we need to go back to that. There's a lot of retirees who have said to me, oh, I'm, I'm past it. No one will listen to me. And I think the opposite. I think the retirees, we really need to encourage them to speak out because as Roz says, as Anne McCloskey, Dr. Anne McCloskey, one of our other lighthouse keepers says, they've got nothing to lose. Absolutely, if you're young, just out of uni, just starting your career, you've got mortgages, kids, it's it's much harder. But the retirees who see what's going on and there'll be vast numbers of them, please, please add your voice because not only... Are you able to say what you want? But actually, the younger ones really respect your wisdom. It's safe in psychological terms. The elders carry wisdom and safety. Mm. Just give me maybe an example or two of the visions that these people have. What what sort of bright uplands are they looking forward to? I think a really common theme that we're all looking forward to is that we believe we've come to this crazy place in history where we've never been so divided, where there's huge amounts of trauma going on. But from that, it's almost that we sort of had to hit that horrific place from which people could then start waking up and looking at the psychology, but also the history. How have we got to this place in humanity? And what are the lessons that we can learn here? Because when we understand how we got here, We all need to have, I mean, there's been too much trauma, but some of it, we just need to laugh at ourselves, laugh at these incredibly arrogant, um, myself included, I've had enormous arrogance over the years, um, positions I've taken where I have just had no discernment about other people's opinions. So I think it really is that it's almost like a a, a raising of consciousness um, that 
this is going to bring about and we all really believe that and i despite everything that's gone on i'm i'm really excited for the future i i think we're we're headed for incredible times but i do believe a lot of the current incumbent systems do need to be dissolved and reformed um, i do hope you're right but there is also risks so let's, I'm, I'm glad glad to hear an optimistic outcome. How do we uh, support Lighthouse practically? Will you give us all the links that we need? Absolutely. The, any, any practical things? I'll give you all the links. We're just about to start our social media campaign. One thing I would ask, John, if it's okay, we have done a little bit of social media the last few weeks and we pick up thousands of likes and retweets and comments, um, many likes and retweets. Signing the declaration is 30 seconds to a minute max. But I think we live in this world now where so many people are scrolling on their phones and they do the like and the retweet. And I would really encourage people, if you want to be active, please come and sign the declaration. We do have a, uh, a survey that goes to health professionals as well. And we've, we put that out um, a few months ago, sort of building up a story of what the health professionals have been through around the world. And as I'm sure you can imagine, that's starting to paint quite an incredible picture um, you know obstetricians who are now cutting down trees and um, anaesthetists waiting tables there's there's huge numbers of people and it's a really powerful message so we do want to uh, keep collecting those stories and we'll be coming back with them fairly soon I have um, had to pause that survey just briefly because there's been some changes in how the mandates and things are working in different countries but that'll be up again in a week um, and yes, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned at the start, uh, a colleague of mine and I, we are starting a psychological awareness, um, I don't know if it would be a podcast uh, sort of series, um, and in that we are going to be talking a lot about how to speak to people. And again, understanding from a psychological perspective that trying to sort of shout more and more data at people, it's not the way, it's, it's the way we very gently start planting seeds um, is it, it, it's using psychological strategy to be as effective as we can in order to slowly peck at the back of the brain so that people can then themselves start questioning they have to do it themselves we can't have you got that de the declaration there ros what does it say uh yes do, we, do you want me to pull up the website i'm not yeah, sure if I can yeah 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 just read out the declaration so we'll... oh the, the declaration's quite long um give, give us I, the gist I, of it then okay so i'll just go to the uh the sort of four key points yeah um number one all silencing and censorship by bureaucrats and regulators including of experienced practitioners and scientists must stop there must be respect for every individual's right to freedom of opinion and expression Number two, the right to informed consent must be upheld and it must include being fully informed of relevant risks as well as any benefits proven or presumed. Number three, mandates and other forms of medical coercion are unethical and must cease. Bodily autonomy is the inalienable right of every individual and must be respected. And number four, there's an urgent need for transparency and reform in science and medicine and to halt the increasing globalization of public health. We demand the restoration of voice and decision power to individual practitioners and to those they serve. There's not much to disagree with there, is there? I don't think so, not really. And, and yet such obvious things just aren't being done and we can all see that that's, yeah. that's happening. So, so that, is, that is there, we'll put the links to that. Um, links to your new materials we, we are going to try and put together some of the visions perhaps of the lighthouse keepers i think that would make uh, a really interesting thing for for viewers um mm -hmm. to, to look at um that we'll work great. on that um so lots of interesting things happening delighted to have an optimistic uh, video we do deal with quite a few pessimistic subjects on here i'm afraid oh, so, um, but I think the power of humanity, yes, there, there are very many things, huge concerns in all of this. Um, and similarly, I, I hear people talking about them most days. But ultimately, I, I really do believe in the goodness of humanity. And the and future is in our hands, but we have to act and uh, shape it, it and take it. And that's it. 
that's it and again while please do sign and while this is just um while we're talking about medical the censorship of medical professionals it's, it's not just for medical professionals to sign at all it's for everyone to sign yeah. um so everyone watching is free to sign that yes that declaration. yeah great well, as for now, um, hopefully we'll talk again. And uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to editing this. I normally find editing a bit boring, but there's so much interesting stuff. I want to listen to it again. <laughs> and well, thank you for thank you for all the psychology, which is uh, which uh, some completely new stuff and refreshing some some old stuff for me. So so that's great. So great. for now, uh, just tell us what temperature it is in, is in Sydney at the moment. Is it is it still hot? I, I'm not in Sydney. I'm not in Sydney. Oh, you're in, in the, the mountains, of course, yeah. So it's yeah, cooler I'm in the mountains. mountains. It snows where I live, believe it or not. People get a bit wow. surprised at that. Um, so it is, I'd, I'd say it's about 17 Celsius. Oh, that's like not that. too bad. I can't cook, cook yeah. that. Mm. <laughs> How is it in um, lovely Carlisle? Oh, it's, it, it's, it's always warm and sunny here, apart from the days it isn't like today. It's been about, today's been warm, it's about nine degrees, but pretty damp, greyish, rainy. Mm. It's beautiful, Carlisle's beautiful. We kind of get used to it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We take vitamin D because we don't make it from the sun. Oh, isn't that a conspiracy <laughs> yeah. theory though, John? Uh, it could be, because I, 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 I talk about it, so I guess it must be. But, uh... One of our lighthouse keepers, Paul Oosterhouse, he had the medical board on the phone, and his what he got pulled up for was because he talked about vitamin D on uh, Twitter. Unbelievable. I know. But we'll follow the evidence wherever it leads. <laughs> so for now, Roz, thank you very much. Thank you, John. It's been a pleasure.